And welcome everyone. I'm really excited to see all of you. We are here for our Pitch to Win webinar um, designed for um, food funded presenters that we'll be seeing next month, food funders presenters that we might be seeing in the future, the food funded curious, um, and just in general entrepreneurs that will be presenting um, to investors um, in the future, regardless of if it's affiliated with food funded or not. So my name is Renata and I'm part of the Slow Money Leadership Team and also one of the producers of Food Funded. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues, Arno and Merrill to take us away. Welcome, we're so happy to have you all here today and we love hosting this part of our introduction to the food funded community because it really helps kind of alleviate any of the questions that you may have about what it's like to present to these in types of investors and some of our um, community and our activators, our audience, um, which includes entrepreneurs and past participants. So it's really a wonderful place to gather and learn together. And we love taking this moment to really um, take you through some of the things that we've learned from our, our past presenters, from our own knowledge of what it's like to be an entrepreneur and what it's like to raise capital. And then also we really like taking somebody that will be participating um, through the pitch, not to put them in the hot seat, but really to kind of show you how you can take some of the tips and tricks that we're going to share today and really hone your skills in preparation for presenting your own personal pitch. So with that, I just want to show you just quickly that is on the screen is the agenda and what we're going to cover today. Um, we will be having one of our wonderful um, alum, Sadie Schaefer here today. She will be going through her five minute pitch because it's a great example of how it works. Arno is gonna take us through the investor's perspective. I'm gonna share some best practices on how to put your deck together. And then, as I said, we're going to have a wonderful um, person from the audience participate in our practice pitch. And I will tell you about that when we get there, because I want to keep the surprise. We'll have time for some Q&A at the end. And then Renata is going to close us all out and just remind us how to join us on October 15th in Berkeley, California for Food Funded. So with that, um, I'm hoping Sadie is on the call. There we are. Okay, so uh, before I jump into the pitch, I guess my my general explanation of how I design a pitch is I'm really looking to be as authentic as I can rather than trying to put together like the pitch that I think someone wants to hear. Because I think when you're speaking from the heart, it's going to land and people are going to see that passion that you bring because investors are really looking to invest in the team and the and the leader. Um so that's my, my two cents before we jump in. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Sadie Sheffer and I'm the CEO and founder of Bread Seriously. We make seriously delicious gluten-free sourdough bread that's also free of the top nine allergens, certified kosher and made with organic ingredients in Oakland, California. Next slide, please. Uh, so sourdough is this amazing, magical bread uh, bread making method that is all made with wild yeast and bacteria rather than processed single strain yeast, which eliminates a lot of the health benefits of a fermented bread. Um, and all of our products are made with our wild sourdough starter in Oakland. Uh, we have this beautiful crumb and crust. If you are gluten free or know someone who's gluten free, you probably know that texture is everything with gluten free products. And we have a home run with the texture of our gluten free sourdough breads that are not only good for you with the amazing health benefits of fermentation, but are good for employees. Next slide, please. Our mission at Bread Seriously is to reunite people with sourdough when they thought good bread was off the table. That's people with celiac disease, autoimmune disorders, and other gluten intolerance and other uh, disorders like that. Um, and the second part of our mission is to build a better workplace while doing it. Next slide, please. 
This is our beautiful team that literally has an award-winning company culture. So in 2021, we were named one of the best small businesses to work for in the Bay Area by the San Francisco Business Times and Silicon Valley Business Journal. This was based on employee surveys. Um, so the feedback that our employees gave, like they literally called it um, the best place to work. So we are building this amazing team based on communication, teamwork, and respect. Um, we value diversity and equity and inclusion in our business. And our team is just made up of the most amazing people who stay at Bread Seriously long-term, are super engaged in their work across all departments, um, and are just so wonderful to work with. Um, next slide, please. So this is our all women leadership team. Um, since making these slides, Nicole on the far right has been promoted to director of marketing as well. Uh, and the four of us together are making the decisions. <laughs> the four of us together make sure that every business decision is really rooted in our values to serve, nourish, and include. We also pride ourselves on hiring. We call hiring one of our company superpowers. And the four people on this slide are the ones who are uh, finding our amazing team of employees and making sure that we are retaining them long term. So our numbers are uh, something we are super proud of. Um, we have about 50% of our business uh, in e-commerce and the other 50% in retail. So for e-commerce, we have an amazingly loyal customer base. We see a 65% returning customer rate. Um, with a $135 lifetime value for e-commerce customers and almost triple that for subscribers. In retail, our best accounts see about 80 turns per week across our five SKUs, and we're ranked the number two bread at Erewhon behind Siete, which isn't even a bread, so we're super, super proud of holding that spot. Next slide, please. We have plenty of com competition out there. We differentiate ourselves in a couple of ways. So we differentiate ourselves from our conventional competitors on the bottom right by being in that premium category and using organic ingredients. And then we differentiate ourselves from our sourdough competitors on the top left, who they really lean into health messaging as the primary message of their brands. Um, and so we are creating a bit of space by going back to our roots and being the authentic San Francisco sourdough brand. So leaning into that taste and texture and nostalgia that plucks at people's heartstrings because our customer is someone who thinks that they can no longer eat this food that they love. Next slide, please. Our customers are buying premium, better for you, free from products like the companies on this slide. Erewhon actually found that when someone buys bread seriously, they are 13 times more likely to also buy Siete products. So we are helping retailers up their average basket size. Next slide, please. We've had a couple of slow years since COVID, but are pulling out of it. And we've spent that time wisely dialing in our gross margin. We're now at 56% for 2024 um, to make sure that our unit economics are spot on and scalable so that now we can just find those sales. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide is a bit out of date since food funded last year, but our plan now is all about distribution. We just launched with dairy delivery in Northern California this past month. Um, and in 2025, it's gonna be all about opening up SoCal distribution to find that scale. Next slide, please. So I, of course, am in love with this brand. This has been the last 13 years of my life um, and I could talk about it all day, but I will let, I will close out with my favorite customer quote. Thank you so much. Okay, that was fantastic. Sometimes the ask is not always monetary. And this is because the this is such a diverse community. People often find uh, mentors, they find access to distribution, they find access to other retailers. So it really um, doesn't always have to be monetary. Obviously, that's we're trying to create a, an environment for impact investing, people plan it. But this really demonstrates that. And so what's great about Sadie's slides is you got to see that she was telling you a story. Those slides were not the focal. There wasn't a lot of wording on there that you were trying to read in that background. And that she really does when she even gave her introduction before she started about this authenticity. 
And so it's really about when you're there, five minutes is five minutes. That was kind of the slide that got lost up at the top there with the clocks um, and three minutes for Q and A. You really want that timing because this is a story. You don't have time to go into charts and, and things like that. So when you're, you saw graphics and you saw kind of this whole story coming together is so crucial, which is why we are so grateful to have you join us today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now. This is, this is Anna. Can I ask say, a quick question for, yes. uh, for Sadie? Usually when you're on stage, you have a beautiful story why you actually got into gluten-free bread. And I think you kind of skipped this today. I want to give you an extra like 45 seconds to add uh, your, uh, the white. Thanks, Arno. You know what? I totally forgot. <laughs> yes, usually on my first slide, I give the quick uh, curiosity building story about starting Bread Seriously. So um, I actually started Bread Seriously by accident. I learned how to bake gluten-free cakes and breads um, to impress my college crush because I moved across the country to date him. Um, but the feeling was not mutual. So I decided that because he was gluten intolerant, if I learned how to bake, uh, I would be, uh, you know, more attractive to him. So it did work. Finally, uh, I took about 10 months of me developing recipes before he and I finally got together. And we've been happily married for the last eight years. I right. love it. And it's perfect because, you know, Arno, it's time for you to take over and tell us what's happening in the audience. Yes. So that's a different type of uh, return on investment. I thought uh, that should be shared. Um, uh, Renata, I will, I will say click, not uh, next slide, because sometimes it's forwarding within the same uh, slides. So, so then uh, click. So uh, when we talk, often you talk, oh, I need to meet, uh, talk to investors. I need to uh, meet with investors as if the investor would just like one, like, homogeneous group and they were all alike. So first, before I say is like what are investors looking for is like, what type of investors are we actually talking about? So next slide. Um, so let's talk about lots of investors actually differentiate um, what appetite they have and what are they looking for. So to make it like real scientific, so we have like uh, one axis of what's the vision of impact? So how much of a difference are you gonna make? And the other one is, what is your ability to execute? These are like two main things that I and a lot of even conventional investors are looking for when they look at a, a new venture. So vision of impact, of course, is what do you do for people, Jedi, planet, love, and then on the ability to execute, it's like, what's the track? Uh, what's what's your track record and the team? How solid is your plan? And who are you partnering with? So click. Of course, everybody wants always to be in the upper right corner. So if and ask yourselves where you are in terms of ability to execute and your strength of your vision. So if you really people think you're in the upper right corner, of course everybody wants to invest in you. That's uh, or talk to you. And in the lower left corner, it's like, why do you even bother talking if the impact uh, is not as strong and the ability to execute is also not as strong. Now, who are the investors? Uh, among the investors, there are some who talk about money to make impact. So impact is in the foreground. And then there are some who talk about impact to make money. So money is in the foreground. So there's a good overlap between those two groups, but you should know who you're talking to. And then uh, click. When you now look at what investors you see, so Renata, click, thank you. So I think more forgiving are like friends and families if your ability to execute is not as strong, even if your vision is not as strong. So they sometimes come in. And venture capital is actually usually very risk averse. Venture capital is not um, risk friendly as some people think because the main reason is look at your investors. There are some investors who make decisions about their own money. And there are investors who make decisions about other people's money. Got that? So investors who make decisions about their own money and uh, people who make decisions about other people's money. Venture capital makes 
decisions about other people's money. So covering their behind and not making risky decisions that they have to defend their investments to the uh, silent partner or limited partners in the fund is something that they're very concerned about. So ability to execute is definitely stronger. And if the vision is not so strong, they're in. But then there are many other types of investors. So click like angel investors, foundations, family offices, or even corporate uh, um, uh, companies have like investment arms. So they often look more stronger on the impact side and um, and ability to execute. They can be more forgiving. But the, the main slide, uh, the main reason I'm sharing this view with you is you cannot have the same story for all of them you need to adjust your stories and your slides and how you roll the story a little bit differently. And I put myself like probably more in the upper left corner and I'll be talking more to those who like have a strong focus on impact. So keep that in mind. I'm not talking like a bank officer or a venture capital partner right now because different people have different expectations and I'll talk to, uh, to the expectation that I have or people like me. So click, please. So let's give me, let me give you like three pitch essential that I, that get me interested and, ke and keep my interest up when I see you on stage because uh, next click, um, I'm in a, ro a room full with a lot of people. There are a lot of pitches, lots going on that day. You don't have my unguided, uh, uh, or my uncompleted attention because I'm in a room just with you. So first thing is you need to get my attention with bold statements and just a few points, not a big, not a big uh, complex stories with a lot of segues. That would plant less of a memory hook um, uh, um, than um, you would just tell me the simple story and I then have those simple memory hooks that make me follow up with you later on, because that's what this is all about. I'm not going to make a decision right in the room listening to your five minutes. I'm not get, getting my checkbook out. The main reason you give this pitch on stage to make me want to talk to you. Click. And one of the critical things is that tell me right away what your company is about. Click. Because if you don't, what's happening in my mind, I keep guessing what is what is he or she about? What is that company doing? And then I keep guessing, I'm getting onto a different track in my, in my brain. I'm not paying full attention to you. I'm comparing you maybe to some other companies that I have seen and I think you're like them. And all of a sudden I'm not thinking about you. So right within the first, minute uh, or 30 seconds tell me what this is about like um Sadie did this beautiful says this is about gluten-free bread okay she's not talking about all the details of celiac disease and climate change and um and burning forests and all of this and then two and a half minutes later she comes to what the solution is spell it right away right uh click another thing that's important to me is the you and why are you into this? So the uh, click again. So a lot of people spend a lot of, uh, in the pitches that I'm listening to, and I'm listening to a lot of pitches, and I have made like probably close to 50 startup investments right now, and most of them came actually through the Food Funded channel. What clicks with me first is seeing your why. And that's why I insisted Sadie uh, shared the um, uh, why with us because that I definitely remembered when she shared the story about her baking bread to uh, to um, uh, gain her love interest which is not the usual thing uh, so not everybody has that type of story but I want to know what what matters to you because foremost you want me to emotionally connect to you there is this like um uh, prejudice that we all like make rational decisions about numbers that comes later but first you get my connection with you through an emotional hook so tell me why you're doing this and who you are and why you commit your life to doing this this is super important click 
And then the other thing is that I want to hear from you is usually I hear a lot about your products and you know your products and your competition really well and not click. What I what I really want to know is what do you know about your customers? Who are your customers? What's the feedback that you're getting with them? What's the traction that you have with them? Because knowing more about your customers gives me the uh, the warm and fuzzy feeling as an investor that this is not just your idea. You actually know who will actually be paying the bill later on. And it shouldn't be all customers. Whenever I hear, oh, my customers are everybody who wants to live healthy. I say, no, go back to, uh, let's go back to, to the drawing board and be more specific. And if you can tell me the feedback and the story and say the ended on a nice uh, feedback and your traction, uh, that is really uh, beautiful. What doesn't turn me on is when I see all those market bubbles, oh, the total addressable market is 3.6 billion for my category. And honestly, I'm not that smart, but I'm not, also not the dumbest guy, but we investors don't have it right now in our head what's the difference between a 3.6 billion market and a $6.3 billion market. That's very abstract. That you can tell me later. It's more like what what are your customers saying and how they're picking it up? Um, next uh, click. So, and in that vein, it's good if you give me a glimpse of your game plan, how you want to execute, where you are, and how you get to the top of the mountain that you want to climb. But I don't want to see like a slide with like spreadsheets and detailed numbers and everything. You should have this, but that's for later. Uh, that's maybe for a second or um, third day. That's not first date material. And um, yeah, another click then. I think it all burns down. What you present me in the five minutes is not the full story, not the whole, not the full pint of ice cream, just the taste, just the teaser click. Um, and it's most important. Sometimes you think, oh my God, if I don't pack, put everything in there, then I leave people with too many questions. If people have questions after you gave you five minutes, that's the best thing that could happen to you. Hallelujah. I have questions. I want to talk to you. That's the best thing. I'll, I'll find you at the table or at the reception in the break over lunch or whatever, when we can talk. That's the start of the, con of the follow up conversation. So leave me with some questions. Just give me the teaser, but plant the emotional hook and show um, that your traction with customers confirms that you're onto something. So that's like my my quick summary on what uh, how you get and keep my attention while you're talking and then get me to your table. Remember that you are planning for a certain limited amount of time. And so whether it was one minute, five minutes, seven minutes, you're going to have different types of presentations for each type of audience. We're focused today on what happens on the stage, that five minutes with the follow-up three um, minutes for Q&A. So it's really important on the do side to keep it simple, practice and practice again, practice with friends and family. If you have employees, practice with them. You want as much feedback, but you want it to come naturally. You want it to be confident and you want it to tell it in your style and your voice. So if you write out a script to match your slides, then make sure you're using words that come comfortably to you. And if you hesitate on it, scratch that and try something else. And we said, no, you're asked. And so Sadie had a very good point about for her, it was a private race. So she couldn't go up there and say, hey, join my crowdfund. However, the ask, as I said earlier, doesn't always have to be monetary. So think about that. What is it that you need out of this group um, that you want? The don'ts are don't just come up there, wing it, and, and think that it's going to go well. Don't exaggerate um, and say you're in X amount of stores or doing these things that aren't there yet. Um, and the reason I keep telling you to practice and go back again and again and really hone this is because you really to come authentically and you don't want to be standing there reading from your phone or a piece of paper. You want people to focus on you. So the next slide, you are the story. That's, that's 
as you you know saw in Sadie's, it was about Sadie and it was about what she's built and how she's accomplished it and the team that she has and where she is in the journey today. Yes, she did uh, miss that that golden opportunity that we all love and remember about her, about how she courted her her love of her life. Um, but we want you to focus on you. That's what this is about, the engagement with your story and how you got there. Next slide. Simple slide design is really crucial. This, you do not want people, you want, again, if you're the story, we want people looking at you, not the, behind you. And if there's words up there and numbers and, and collages of photos, it's distracting. So your stories, you know, the images you choose should be bold. They should stand out. They should give an indication of what you're talking about. Next slide. The other part of this is the text um, also should be easy to read. Now, it does not mean that it can't be whimsical and, and fit in with the design and your branding because that's also part of your story. But make sure that you can read it. Make sure that you can read it from far away. I said, don't have a lot of words on there and make sure the words are there. Continue to tell the story that there's a hook in there they're, or they're guiding you to what's coming next or what you've already covered. So now the next slide, click. Um, simple numbers, Arno address this. Yeah, you know, we don't want spreadsheets. We don't want projections. If you do use a chart, make sure it's, again, it's easy to follow. You saw um, a, using, this is why we have one of our alum come and do it, and CD so great about this. Hers were in blowouts with the pictures, and so they were easy to follow where she talks about the lifetime value of a customer, some of the sales numbers, but they were easy to keep within the theme of what she was talking about, and they weren't a distraction. Um, and so with those three things, simplicity, font style, bold images that are not, you know, not collages and your numbers that are easy to follow. We're going to go into our next part of this, and that is the pitch practice. And I'd love to invite Joe to come on up. Hi, folks. And Joe is going to introduce himself, and he's been willing to <laughs> go through his pitch, the way that he presented it to our screening committee and allow Arno and I to give a few um, moments of feedback. But also, as I said, the whole purpose of today, what we're trying to create here is an educational opportunity with some hints and ways to make things easier for you to communicate, easier for you to stand out. So when you're ready, let us know. Renata um, will advance your slides for us, but first introduce yourself and thank you for joining us. No problem. Well, hi everyone, my name is Joe No. I'm the founder and owner of Helladak Big Foods and we are a CPG company focused on frozen Asian fusion meals. I don't know how many of you have kids out there, but my son goes to elementary school. I volunteer there multiple times a year. And one thing I notice is the school lunches, you know, could be better. When you think about school meals, you think about low quality, low price, and I want to change that. Next. So the problem is there are limited meal options here. If you look at all these pictures on the screen, you'll notice it's a lot of processed meats and cheeses, and that's because there's a lot of government subsidies that, that take care of that. We want to change that. And look at that, that corner image right there of the sandwich. If you're a vegetarian, your only option really is a sun butter jam sandwich and that's it so you know limited meal options that leads us into the next slide what else can we change biggest problem is just limited culinary experience and skill by the staff at these schools they're doing the best they can they no longer have a full kitchen and so they just fall back on what they know which is just you know very limited american mexican american and american italian cuisines and we want to fix that next so what we're going to provide for folks is just uh, you know convenient, diverse meals for these providers. Every school district has a uh, lead district, a uh, lead person in charge of choosing all their food for the district, and we want to make their life easier. We want to make sure that they provide a uh, diverse, 
diet for their students. And this is what we're gonna do. We have variety, it's all gonna be within their budget and it's gonna be scalable. And all the folks there that work on those premises, it's gonna be limited training. You don't need to have culinary school experience to, to handle this. A lot of our foods are pre-packaged, easy to reheat in mass in the equipment at the schools. Next. So just some numbers, you're thinking how large is this market? There's approximately not 6 million students here in California alone. And the budget for that is normally $1 per meal allotted per student per day. So you think about that. That sounds like not much, but it's a large volume. Next. And if you want to look at the U.S. market, total U.S. market is approximately 50.6 million students there across the nation. And that's where we eventually want to go. But for now, we really want to focus in California and then slowly move out and expand. Next. So here's the breakdown. On average, we're saying school budgets, dollar per burrito, average school district is around 10,000 students. Uh, the cost to produce a burrito, including uh, ingredients, as well as producing those burritos themselves are 60 cents. So that leaves a 40 to 45% margin for us. Next, please. So here's the competition. You'll notice that I highlighted in the magenta circle um, some things that you know schools are really looking at now closely, especially the state of California. There are a lot of new rules and regulations limiting how much fat, sodium content that students can have. Um, these two brands right here, the first two on the, the left, are in trouble because they have really high amounts of saturated fat and sodium. So that's where we come in. We're that last column where we come in we meet all the nutritional guidelines that the state requires and kids are gonna love it. One thing that we realize is a lot of these foods are just cheese heavy. And so we provide a lot of alternatives that don't contain cheese or dairy for those students, but it still tastes great, still beats the whole grain requirement and protein requirement for the school districts. Next. So by the numbers, you know, we start off selling fried rice burritos at farmer's markets. To date, we've sold 9,000 within the past eight months, and we've made a total of $55,000 in revenue. Uh, we currently are in two supermarkets and two grocery stores wholesale. Next. And so right here is a list of all the places that we're at. We've actually catered for large companies like Chase and Kaiser. We've also gone viral online. We had one video gain 150,000 views. Um, and growing. Next. So what's our plan? You know, we need to do more outreach to these heads of school districts, their nutritional programs. Um, the goal here is to get in and we're looking at orders of twice a month, basically. So we wanna be a part of their monthly menu rotation. The other thing is we wanna actually spend some money uh, rebranding as well where you know, we don't have a brand, a total brand for the school, but we will have a nice packaging and everything like that. Next. And this is outdated, but I'll still roll with it. We're asking for a $100,000 loan to spend on our initial two runs. We found a co-packer um, to do these runs for us, but that requires us to put the money up front. And when school districts sign on, they normally have terms of net 30 or 60 days. So we still need to stay afloat to keep producing for them. And that's a big portion of what that loan will be used for. But like I said, a portion of that will be used for rebranding and marketing as well. Next. So I'm Joe, founder of Fancy Lunch Crew presented by Heladac Big. If you have any questions, go ahead and reach out to me. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, you were just a few seconds over that. 30, but you know, again, that's what this is about is, is giving you some options to make it a little punchier, to make it um, more focused and tell your story a little bit. So um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the bravery. Thanks for, for Thanks. being a part of this. Um, excellent job, as I said. And so just kind of going back, if you don't mind, we're not a, bring us back to the beginning.
So this is um, great. And if you go to the next um, slide, click. And this really quickly tells me that you're creating um, school meals and you're meeting quality. One thing though, in your introduction, you said we're a CPG brand and you didn't do, you didn't come into the schools, right? So I think if you're gonna talk about schools in, in your, your visuals, you need to also include it in the introduction, right? So, you know, we're creating uh, a better school meal with easy access, something to that effect, right? Just to, to make it a little easier. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of where we're talking about the collages. And I think you can probably eliminate some of these pictures and maybe just find some bigger ones that, that tell it like the PB and J uh, versus that, you know, like the one on the left, right? The upper left corner or the lower, the tray, both of those are really good at kind of demonstrating what the food is today. Yeah. Um, and then the next um, slide, this you did very well on. And I think you really did sum up this, you know, right now, the only two outside Americana type food is, you know, the burrito or the pizza. Next one. Um, so again, this is great, but you don't want people reading and you really want to focus on um, that it's a, you know, the new Asian American fusion cuisine. I don't think you need to, to talk about any of the benefits right now because you, you do touch on some of that. So maybe this is a visual. Okay. Either the packaging of the food, something, you know, that you're talking about what these benefits and what this um, fusion cuisine is that you created, but you don't need the words. You need an image. This is where imaging yeah. comes in. These would be um, the notes, basically. Yeah. Next. Um, so these numbers are not bad. I think that this, you know, this is easily readable and it kind of gets you to it. Um, yeah, I'm going to let Arno touch on this, but I think visually this one works. Next slide. Um. I don't know, you can maybe again, combine these two slides from a before and maybe just show California market, overall USA market. I also think it's important that this is K through 12, mm -hmm. primarily that you're offering and not, you know, because school goes beyond it, but these numbers really reflect that and doesn't really get into the um, community college, et cetera, campus food. So I think it's important to, to just talk about that. I don't think two of these slides is necessary. Um, next one. This was a good slide. Okay. I mean, again, you can make it visually whatever, but I think this really um, explains how you fit in, right? That, and this is where we talked about benefits and budget. And you, this is where it's important to say, there's only about a dollar that actually goes to food per child. We meet that requirement. Next one. Um, this is really hard to understand. So, you know, fat, sodium, and processed are probably the three main things you can talk to. And maybe you have an image and maybe you just talk about, you know, the high fat, the high sodium, um, low protein, and then how you differentiate. And you can do that with probably a lot less of, of this because this is hard to understand and just talk to it. Next one. This is great. Um, and then the next slide. Um, I think this is this too. Arnold will probably have some comments on this, but at least it shows what you've accomplished in this very short period of time and how you're doing it and what you'll continue to do. Next one. Um, here. A lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the game plan. Yeah, this this is unnecessary. I think it, you yeah. when you talked about um, what you're doing today, that's what you need to just say, you know, not how you, what it is, but just basically our outreach is really directed at the school programs, meeting with, you know, the school um, 
the food service supervisors and, you know, eventually with the distributors. But just this, nobody, you don't have time for this. There's no need for it. It's just that's your whole positioning is to get in front of as many school um, leaders as yeah. you can. Yeah, this is third date material. <laughs> All right, next one. Um, and oh, again, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, it can be a visual use of funds, things like that. So yeah, this is just, a you know, a little bit hard, but we get it. And then next one. Yeah. And then thank you, which is great. So Arno, I'm going to let you take over and add your feedback. Yeah, you already covered a lot um, uh, of it. Um, first of all, Joe, uh, great that you take this on. This is, uh, there will be no business like yours on stage because you take something on very specific that's not it's not going to be uh, sexy on the shelves at Kroger's and uh, Whole Foods. It's something that is um, dearly um, like uh, there's not a lot of light on what you do. And uh, so from what I took away from this, you start right out. You tell us what it is. Check. Because I said, I want to hear that at the beginning. You didn't leave me guessing. So this was good. Um, what I would like a little bit more, and I need to, I owe you then to say what you can take out um, to, uh, on the why. I mean, you mentioned that you have a kid in school. That's a connection. But now you make this your life's mission. There may be a little bit more of an, of why are you doing this? Maybe a sentence more that would be, helpful for me to to see more of you so then can we uh, go back to the slide Renata with the limited options I would love when you explain us this one. Um, what the business is it's about school lunches uh, no limited option like the third slide I think okay. what's missing in the entire slide is the perspective who is it for? We don't see any kids enjoying your rice burritos or, or your meal. There are no wow, kids in the good. entire deck. This is what you're doing it for. I Like uh, I said previously in the intro, I want to see something about the customers. I know your kids are not the customers. Even the parents are not the customers. Um, it's, the, um, it's the food buyers in the school districts. But if the kids are not happy, the whole thing breaks down um, probably in some. So we want to see that, bring that in. The first picture that I'm seeing here is actually a picture of what you think are the bad examples. And I also want to comment a little bit on the story flow and how are your slides actually supporting your story flow. This is not working for you because you say limited meal options. And I see immediately, whatever, like 30 different things on plates that doesn't go with limited. And that because I cannot really see how bad they are because they're like too small, but Got it's it. not it's not enforcing limited. And Mel already talked to this before you get to a bad picture, and the bad picture being the first picture that I now connect with your brand. You should have shown us something with kids and a rice burrito, like this is what you do, and then you can go into the problem um, a little bit. Um, so this is important because you don't want emotionally you don't want me to connect you with this picture if this is the first picture coming up uh, and click to the next one please uh, the flags kind of did not really support what you were saying i mean mel liked it but it's like it's a one one degree to abstract with the flags um but i like that you don't spend a lot of uh, words on the slide so having all of this, as you outline the the um, the problem, I would first come out and zoom into your solution and not tell me all the market data. Tell us what the solution is, what you're offering to the market. There were like those four categories. Uh, if you go like four, like two or three slides forward, I think that would be yeah this slide here, and then again with pictures, not with uh, uh, PowerPoint bullet points. That would carry me over and my advice would even be for credibility circus 
what your uh, uh, um, purpose, what you have in the end, what is your, um, what's the traction 9,000 already being served, put this right after the solution. So because so, yeah. then you're telling it me, all the way up, this is not just in Joe's idea space in his head. Joe has been doing this with his company already quite a bit. So move the traction up right after your solution. And then you can go to um, to the market uh, and the big numbers. I quite frankly don't need to have the national lump numbers and the California numbers separately mm -hmm. because everybody can research how many counties are out there. So that's not like telling me much. The real story is that there's only $4 that is allocated for school lunches. And out of this one, $4, only one actually goes to the food. People yeah. in the audience yeah. don't know this. You need to make a big point of this because that basically uh, is the big economic constraints that you're working on. So if you go yeah. to the uh, go to the next slide after the uh, after the, this slide here, that is the big hammer, and it's really not yeah. just sales breakdown. It's basically school lunch by the numbers. And those who had a chance to watch the John Oliver episode on um, on school lunches have already got like that hammer. There is like four dollars that they can spend, and one dollar goes to the food, and you have to produce this for sixty cents. I would even put like two quarters and a dime on that picture to really yeah, emphasize am, how much yeah. goes into this, like to really bring that home. This is specific, that is really what you are about to be bare bones quality, right? You need to bring that home. This is like the most important things. All the other numbers how many billions and how many school districts it's just a distraction this is what your company is about to provide to school districts an alternative at a bare bond budget and not because the, the parents or the kids wouldn't pay more this is what the school districts have available so uh that is best uh that's my main feedback on the storyline oh yeah one on the competition and now we'll go a little bit on design that competition slide, you want to focus the attention what's in that purple, um, in that purple circle. Yeah, it's tiny. Hell, nobody can read this in the audience. No. My recommendation, my recommendation, take one of the examples up, blow it up, and then have the other, and then have yours on the side. And as and you, know, you said, this is one of the examples, and you can have the logos of the other ones, but not four blurbs of nutrition facts, so that. Uh, whatever is in that uh, purple thing actually can be read and is, is illustrative. This is overwhelming and I'm getting like the TLDR too, um, too long, didn't read kind of a situation. Uh, so that's, that's I think, the main story. I like that you uh, start and end with your contact info. And this is for everybody on this call. Do yourself a favor if you're a new brand and a new business, put your put your logo, what your company is on every slide in the lower right corner or somewhere in a corner so that everybody as they're looking at you is just if they came into the room later, so know who um, who you are. So that's also another like recommendation. I could say a lot about like the uh, the typography which I feel very passionate about. But the funny thing in your case is you're sticking with PowerPoint Arial, which is not very imaginative, but everybody else should think about this. But for your case, for bare bones, 60 cents school lunches, it's almost goes completely with the it's, message you're using the bare bones on brand. font on your slides. Arial goes with 60 cents. Food lunches. I would not recommend this for other people. So just want to, and the and the black on white, all black and all white is sometimes a little bit of a stark contrast on the eyes. But in your case, I let you get away with this because it may work. It goes with the bare bones message. So this is my, my, uh, uh, my high level um, feedback. But I think most of it, uh, move who is it for bring students into the pictures and show your products and not just your competitors and not just the problem uh, pictures. And that's how you get my emotional buy-in and then 
further attention, right? And the Big Bang is, of course, the 60 cents. And I was prepared for the Big Bang because I had John, seen John Oliver, but not everybody has um, in the audience has had the, um, uh, the benefit of having seen it. So that's my high level feedback. Excellent. No, I, I Excellent. appreciate all of this. Um, all right. So we are getting close to our hour, and I want to give about two minutes worth of Q&A from the audience. Um, Hello, and then... Go. Can, and we can stay a few minutes, absolutely. Um, but I also want to be able to bring Renata back in to close us out. And um, I'm not sure if Sadie was able to stay Next on, slide. but if, um, but I want to send another shout out to her for joining us and, and sharing her incredible pitch with us again and really setting the stage for what we've accomplished today. So um, if you want to give us a question, um, and I will look at the, the chat as well, but just um, unmute yourself and your camera and jump in. Uh, this is Laura Shankar from BKN. Can you hear me? This is Laura Shankar yes. from BKN. <laughs> uh, we, um, when we're pitching with investors, we've sort of tilted very strongly to talking to them about how they're gonna put a dollar in and get $10 out, how they're gonna make money. It sounds like the direction for this specific group is different. We do have an impact mission-driven company uh, and we've been sort of letting that go to the background. It usually comes out as we're talking. So it's it's. I don't think it's a real problem. Would you guys suggest that we really tilt or lean into the impact piece? Yeah, Arnie, I, you wanna I, take that? I mean, you you, I, I, uh, I think I come for the impact and stay for the execution. Ooh, very nice. Oh, <laughs> great wisdom. Thank you. That's perfect. Anyone else want to jump in with a question? Yeah, we have a few. And the. If I just pick up the last one here from Ben, yes, he has, ben. what if you're early stage and you don't have any sales and customer feedback and you're looking for investors? Um, and by the way, uh, Renata, can you click one slide forward because there's like the nice registration discount uh, on there if you attended this uh, webinar. So uh, if you don't have any customers and um, and sales yet, you should have some type of proof of concept that you what you do is wanted in the market. You have some focus group or did some tests or something with a little volume, with a small volume that you don't spend too much money on because you should actually have some type of feedback about a proof of concept for market, a product market fit before you spend a lot of money or you ask um, investors to spend money on you. So some type of feedback loop should be there. Usually at Food Funded, we only see companies on stage that are already selling in the market. So it's not a uh, big issue. But Ben, if you're like earlier, uh, proof of concept, even if you're not in the market, look for it, some type of feedback. I, and I'm going to just build on that because um, one of the things, and, and I don't think I, I really introduced myself earlier as being part of Food Funded, but I do work a lot with founders and from early stage into you know scaling and exiting and it's really um this part of the question of where you are to arno's point in your proof of concept right so have you innovated have you refined a category or have you completely disrupted it and and i think that there's ways in which you can discuss that but this is where that friends and family part comes in but it's also where do you fit in that marketplace? So it is a conversation that you always have to ask yourself, is this a, a business or is this a hobby? And where are you? And where are you, again, innovating something that's never been seen or done before, refining as an existing category, and you're just taking it up to a different level or in a, a different use. Um, 
or disrupting, right? And that means, again, between innovation and refinement, you've got something that just kind of blows things up. And one thing also, I want, if you're early stage, a lot of people who are good on stage, like Sadie, they have attended Food Funded as an attendee before and really got a good feel talking to people at the event, to investors and getting building early relationships. And then often they go on stage a year or two later, now being way more confident in, um, and being on stage and asking for money. So there's a question from... Azizam 2024 as um, so about being shy uh, for asking for money. Um, there's a way to ask for money. You could say to be successful with everything that you have pointed out what success means and what you're striving for, you need that amount of money. You could just like say it neutral, like say to be to achieve the milestones that I want to achieve or next milestone. I need this type of funding to spend on this and these type of expenses or um, internal um, capital or something like this. And then it's pretty clear to everybody in the audience that this is the ask, right? But tell people what's the capital needed to be successful. And I would not make any promises about payback. That's actually unsavory right and so if you invest in me you get your money back um threefold by in four years that's unsavory and um uh, and often um illegal <laughs> yes we, we we don't want anyone in trouble illegal including ourselves <laughs> true true um i think that's about as much time as we have and so i'm gonna you know um you can reach out to us um, through this um, invite that you got today. If you don't know how to reach us, you can um, come back and find us in a variety of different ways. And we're here to answer additional questions. But I do want to turn this back to Renata so she can bring it home and tell us a little bit about our QR code and, and what to expect on October 15th. Great. Um, thank you so much, um, Meryl and Arno. And huge thanks again, um, to both Sadie and Joe, Joe for your bravery, um, and to each of you for choosing to spend an hour of your Friday afternoon with us. We hope you also choose to see us on October 15th in Berkeley, California for our food funded event. Um, as Meryl mentioned at the bottom of the screen here, you should see a QR code which will provide access to a community discount. I also dropped that link in the chat. Um, and again, it's going to be a really great day of community, of networking, of learning from one another, supporting one another, um, and building each other up. We will have some educational sessions. We will have um, the presentations for multiple rounds of entrepreneurs. And we also will culminate in the marketplace, which is an incredible time to just get to sample, to get to meet, to converse. Um, and get some answers, some questions answered as well. So um, we start at 8.30 in the morning and we'll end at 5.30 in the afternoon, again in Berkeley at the David Brower Center. So hope to see many of you there. And again, thank you so much for joining us today.